Hi, my name's Dave, and I collect vintage Viewmaster reels. Each of these discs is like a 3D time capsule, capturing in three dimensions a time and place from the past. I started to wonder what these places were like today, so I've been visiting these locations and making videos about what I find. As we were traveling down Route 66 from Chicago to Lincoln Land and St. Louis, we got to the famous Merrimack Caverns. Not wanting to miss an opportunity for new Viewmasters, I got this set from eBay. It's a more modern three-disc set dated 1971, and it's a cave tour, so I didn't think things would be much different even after 50 years. Viewmaster has quite a connection with caves. The format was invented when William Gruber met Harold Graves at the Oregon Caves. Gruber was using two cameras next to each other to take 3D pictures, and Graves was president of Sawyer's Inc., makers of postcards. The two got along and hashed out what would become the 3D Viewmaster format, and the rest is history. This episode's going to be kind of different. Usually we search out the original locations of each picture to see what's there, but in this case we're being led to each of these locations. It's a tour after all. There's not a whole lot to say about each picture, but the caverns do have a pretty interesting history, so I'm going to show some of what we saw on the tour and separately dig into some of the history of Merrimack Caverns. First up, Merrimack River. The Merrimack River runs for 218 miles through Missouri to the Mississippi near St. Louis. Its name apparently means River of Ugly Fishes. The caverns are just outside of the small town of Stanton. We were staying right on the river in the Merrimack Caverns Motel, just the length of the parking lot from the cave entrance. It's a really scenic area, although we were there a bit early in the year for the trees to have many leaves. It's the river that helped form the cavern system. Most of the ground in Missouri is limestone or dolomite, which is easily carved by water to form cave systems. The state's got about 7,500 different caves, although only about 20 of them are open to the public, and Merrimack is the most visited. The caverns are 4.6 miles long and 400 million years old. We had a great rest at the motel, got up early, and crossed the parking lot to find building entrance. Not much has changed here except the flagpole's taller. You can't really see the big entrance to the cave because the gift shop and restaurant are in the way, but that wasn't always the case. Here's an older picture from the 40s. Back then, the caverns were the most popular roadside attraction on Route 66 in Missouri, and as we'll find, they were very well advertised along the highway. Here's a map of the cave system. These first few caves are enormous, and they were used for shelter by Native Americans for hundreds of years. The French found the cave in 1722, and it was the first cave west of the Mississippi to be explored by Europeans. They were looking, of course, for gold, but didn't find any. They did find saltpeter, which is an ingredient in gunpowder, and they started mining the caves for the mineral. That lasted until the Civil War, when Confederate guerrillas destroyed the mine there, but more on that later. After the Civil War, the large caverns became a popular dance hall. They were big, and the cool cave air beat the summer heat. There became a huge craze for summer cave parties. Missouri's caves were becoming a big entertainment destination, and in 1933, Merrimack Valley native Lester Dill bought the caverns with the intent to turn them into the world's greatest show cave. Dill was a cave explorer and a great promoter. Let's see what we found when we went inside. Moonshiner's Cabin I'm not really sure if moonshiners used the cave or not. They probably did, but here you can see how big the main caverns are. 
And you can see right away the cavern's big claim to fame. They're known as the hideout of the infamous Jesse James. At this point, let's take a little diversion for a history lesson. Who was Jesse James? James was born in 1847 to a relatively wealthy, slave-owning family in Missouri. When the Civil War broke out, James sided with the Confederates. During the war, James and his older brother Frank joined guerrilla groups to fight the Union forces. It's at this time that James could have seen the Merrimack Caverns, as these guerrilla groups were the ones who destroyed the Union saltpeter mine there. After losing the war, James basically continued to fight his guerrilla war against Republicans, robbing Republican banks and hijacking trains carrying prominent Republican passengers. He became the most famous survivor of the Confederate guerrillas and was labeled an outlaw with a reward for his capture. He was killed in 1882 and quickly became kind of a racist's Robin Hood, celebrated by former Confederates as a hero instead of the terrorist he actually was. Now, back to Lester Dill and his newly purchased show cave. Dill was quite the cave explorer, and soon found an opening that led to the extensive upper portion of the cave system. He widened the hole, installed stairs, handrails, electricity, and lights, and the world-famous Merrimack Cavern attraction was born. But what connected all this to Jesse James? Jesse James' loot rock. This is Jesse James's hideout, where he split his loot with his gang. For the first eight years after he bought the cave, Lester Dill only knew about the upper floors of the caverns. But in the summer of 1941, there was a serious drought. That lowered the water table, and a pool of water at the end of the last cavern started to recede, revealing a new passageway. Dill swam through and discovered an enormous new section of cave. In here, he claims to have discovered artifacts connected to Jesse James near this large rock, where I guess he presumed they'd stop to split their loot. He found strong boxes traceable to the train robbery at Gads Hill, Missouri, rifles and shackles. Although if you think about it, James would have had to swim underwater with his loot to get to this rock. I couldn't really find any details on these artifacts, though, so it's hard to know exactly how they're connected. Anyway, the newly discovered cave section is one of the best parts of the tour. Mirror River This shallow river reflects the ceiling and really makes you feel like you're overlooking a Grand Canyon, although the water's only a couple inches deep. This was my favorite part of the tour. The sound of the rushing water in the cave is pretty awesome, although I think they might add that effect since I think it stopped as we walked away. But back to those Jesse James artifacts. Dill did claim that they were connected to the train robbery at Gads Hill, so let's take a look into that. On Saturday, January 31st, 1874, the number 7 express train was on its way from St. Louis, Missouri to Little Rock, Arkansas, and made its regular stop in Gads Hill, a really small lumber town. As they approached, they saw a red flag signal on the platform, and the train was diverted to a sidetrack. The switches on both ends of the siding had been opened, and the train was stuck. It was a robbery. Five masked bandits had captured everyone in town and were holding them all at gunpoint. They diverted the train to a siding and made the crew get off. They robbed the passengers, the crew, the mail car, and they got the key to the safe and took all the money packages. From the news report of the robbery, we do get a list of what was stolen. All the registered mail, a gold watch, and all this. So about $3,000, or about $80,000 in today's money. And they did give the chief engineer a receipt, signing it, Robbed at Gads Hill. 
Then the gang split up and took off. Seems some went south, ate dinner at Mowark, and were in Hot Springs by Friday. The rest went west, and were seen in Lesterville, then Phillipsburg, Big Piney, and finally Bolivar. Did they have time to take their loot to Merrimack Caverns? It's way up here, about a hundred miles out of the way in each direction. And from witness reports, it doesn't sound like they'd have had time to stash their loot there and then being seen eating dinner in Moark just days later. I doubt there's really a connection between Loot Rock and Jesse James, but I'm not sure anyone expects these claims to be anything more than a marketing gimmick anyway. So, on to our next stop, and this is where the history gets really weird. Formations of Jungle Room Way back at the end of the river are lots of stalactite formations. Kind of looks like a jungle. The Viewmaster has them lit up in colors, but for us they weren't doing that. It's still pretty amazing. By the late 40s, the caverns were well established as maybe being Jesse James's hideout. And then, in 1948, a man in Lawton, Oklahoma, suddenly claimed to actually be Jesse James. J. Frank Dalton of Centerville, Oklahoma, claimed to the local newspapers that he was Jesse James, and he'd been in hiding for the last 66 years. This would have made him 100 years old. The local papers really bought into this. It all seems based on Dalton's word and the 60-year-old memories of a handful of people. Dalton started making local public appearances, speaking about what it was like to live in the Old West, although many were starting to suspect the authenticity of his claims. So, if you're promoting your cave as Jesse James's hideout, and Jesse James suddenly reappears on the scene, what do you do? Let's find out after checking out another cave feature. Beautiful Submarine Gardens This section is on the upper level, the earlier discovery by Lester Dill. It's really cool. They light the cave with various colored lights, and it's really impressive. This experience seems exactly like what the Viewmaster photographer would have seen. When Lester Dill and his son-in-law, Rudy Turilli, heard about Jesse James still being alive, they jumped at the chance to use this to help promote the cave. Turilli went to visit Dalton. I suppose it didn't really matter if he believed his story or not, and convinced him to come back to Merrimack Caverns. Dalton basically moved in next to the motel, and Turilli arranged a massive promotional campaign around him. They even published a book, this one, The Truth About Jesse James, written by Phyllis Argall, who'd been a journalist in Japan and was imprisoned as a spy the day after they bombed Pearl Harbor, but managed to make it back to the U.S. after the war. As part of Terilli's big promotion, on what would have been James's 102nd birthday, a giant celebration was planned. A bunch of other people who also claimed to be hundred-plus-year-old outlaws were invited to the party, and many claimed to recognize each other. Dill and Terilli got affidavits from some of them, swearing that Dalton was Jesse James, like this one from John Trammell, who was a freed slave who'd run into the James gang and become their cook for years, and this one from James Davis, who said he was part of the gang and later became a U.S. Marshal. Dalton lived at Merrimack Caverns, visiting with tourists claiming to be Jesse James for a couple years, before moving on to Texas, where he died in 1951. Who knows if he really was Jesse James, or if there was any connection to the cave, but either way, there's some amazing features to see there. World's only onyx wine table. Uh, 
This freestanding table is one of the most famous formations in the cave. It's a six foot tall kind of table supported by three separate legs, which was formed entirely underwater. The grape-like clusters are called botrioids, which is Greek for a bunch of grapes. And Lester Dill was famous for his other marketing schemes, too. One was all the billboards he'd erect along Route 66, and today there's still more than 50 on Highway 44. And before that, he would paint advertisements on farmers' barns, striking a deal with them to fix up their barn or give them a lifetime pass to the caverns in return. A couple of restored versions of these painted barns still exist on old Route 66. But maybe his biggest claim to fame is that he invented the bumper sticker, way back in the 30s. While you were inside touring the cave, he'd send people outside to attach small signs advertising the caverns to your car's bumper with string. And after World War II, developments in inks and adhesives allowed him to create durable paper strips with sticky backs, and the modern bumper sticker was born. Although I'd be kind of upset if he came out and stuck one on my car without me knowing. At this point, our tour's nearly over, but the caverns are a show cave, and the big show is still to come. Stage Curtains At the end of the tour is this 70-foot tall formation that kind of looks like curtains. So the area has been converted to a little theater with seats for the group. Once everyone's seated, you watch a musical video light show. It's very colorful and patriotic, I think representing the entire attraction pretty well. And it's a nice sit down after hiking through the caves too. Then you make your way back down and you exit through the gift shop. Maybe all the hyperbole isn't really true, but the caves are still fantastic. So, what did we learn? I found the Jesse James connections quite the rabbit hole. In the end, it seems unlikely there's really anything to it, but it's interesting how easily people believed it at the time, given that the only evidence was a few people's stories. I don't think people back then were more naive than now, but maybe the proponents of it had something to gain from the claims. Lester Dill sure did. But you have to remember, it's just a private show cave, not a museum, and it's really worth the stop. It's an easy walk and has both wet and dry parts, packing all the interesting cave features into one tour. Anyway, that's it for this episode. Thanks for watching.